Okay. From Glace Bay. Yeah, okay. You're from Riverview. Okay, guys. Well, let me say I'm I'm nervous. I've never given a talk before on entrepreneurship. Especially, I've never even written a slide thingy before, mm -hmm. so bear with me. <coughs> um, so I watched a webinar on how to how to give a talk before I did this. So I came in a little, I small on the template here. Um, so yeah, my story. This see, you're supposed to sort of tell your story first, right? Mm -hmm. So you know why you should listen to me or pay attention to what I say. So. These are my notes, and I just realized I can give myself private notes so you guys don't see, but you have the privy of being in my brain here. <laughs> so, yeah, my family, I came from like a typical sort of lower class household income, split, split household, like my parents divorced, and I grew up thinking that EI was like what you should strive for, <laughs> you know, like your first EI claim is more uh, important than your first job. That was what was in my mind before, you know, I got into this entrepreneurship journey. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about entrepreneurship than code because I'm not a developer. So more of a more of an entrepreneur. Um, so yeah, I grew up all around the island, uh, lived in North Sydney, lived in lived in uh, Myra, lived in Sydney. I went to like seven different schools all over the place. So kind of got a good uh, broad view of how it is everywhere on the island. Um, yeah, so grew up in low housing on uh, Terrace Street, chicken coops, we used to call them because it's like everybody's crammed in together like a chicken coop. And um, I went from that to being, you know, really into uh, theater and present, or not presenting, but uh, writing and performing. And I uh, went from that to then being able to be unemployable. Because I was so had so much like ADHD, I'd go to a job and I'd think, oh, I wonder what this job is like. And I'd want to do something else, and I wouldn't. I would just work at the call centers or work at the theater, and then I I help my father on the milk truck or whatever my grandfather. So then I went from that to being able to earn multiple seven figures from my basement, and then from that I went and I raised a seven figure round for a startup that I started. And that went on to get millions of downloads for for the uh, products that we made, and then uh, have products in <clears throat> hundreds of. Excuse me. I'm so nervous. Why? Why am I so nervous? <laughs> I never talk about this stuff. The products in hundreds of stores. So yeah, it's the mountaintop view, and it's kind of like yeah, I never really think about this myself. I never think, okay, what did I achieve? What did I accomplish? Or whatever. It's sort of like, what am I going to do next? It's always the entrepreneur sort of way of, you don't sit there and revel in your successes. You sort of think, okay, I did that. Okay, whatever. Now what am I going to do? You know, what do I have to do next? And it is a good uh, practice to get into to try to sit back a little bit, take a little view from the mountaintop and say, okay, are my problems actually that bad or are they pretty insignificant compared to what else is going on in the world? And have I achieved something I should be proud of and would, you know, Instead of thinking, "Whoa, well, I got to do something else," you know, kind of, kind of take a little break, give yourself some slack, and be happy with what you've done. So that's my mountaintop view for uh, the last five or six years. Um, go to the next one here. So I would say also, don't you know, if you're gonna have any questions or whatever afterwards, if you have questions, don't be afraid to look stupid. Um, little story there is I was at a conference recently in Toronto uh, called Mastermind Talks and it's this sort of like limited access event where it's a pretty high priced ticket to get in and you uh, you get to mingle and have dinner with and like talk to all these really awesome entrepreneurs and authors and stuff and um, Guy Kawasaki was speaking, you know, Guy Kawasaki, the chief evangelist from, from Apple, famous, and uh, I, was, I was talking, I had a question so I raised my hand up in front of all these other really oh, successful yeah. entrepreneurs. And I was like, okay, he came to me first, obviously, because I'm waving my hand. I say, guy, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm really uh, motivated by you. And, and I watched some of your YouTube videos back in 2008 before the stock market crashed. And you were talking about it. And you, you were talking about buy, you buy some gold because it's going to go up in value. What's your thoughts on gold right now? 
And he kind of looked at me puzzled and he said to everybody else, he's like, I think I just met the first Canadian I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> this guy thinks I'm Robert Kiyosaki from First Dad, Poor Dad. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my God. And my heart sank and I was just like, what an idiot. Okay, I can't. And then I just tried to make some stupid joke about someone put me up to it or something like that and pass the microphone on. But I'm really not racist. I don't just confuse Asian people. It's, it's like a, it's a thing in my brain when I meet people. Like, I, I always mess them up. So don't be afraid to look stupid if uh, you're not going to look as dumb as me in front of all those people. So I would say, you know, entrepreneurs are born. Um, anybody else kind of agree with me on that one or has anyone else sort of felt the same way that it's tough to learn how to be an entrepreneur instead of you know you either have it or you know you maybe you can cultivate it but it's not something that you're not an entrepreneur and then you can just learn it um, I don't know maybe you guys learned that in casting for this for what for the for the startup immersion oh for the, the students themselves? yeah no, uh, we, okay, I'm going to scratch this one out then. That's yeah. not how it works. It was a very, do you want to be an entrepreneur? That, yeah. I think that was one of the questions. What are your entrepreneurial history? Yeah, we went after people that wanted to do it. Good. I have some reminders here. I used to sell hacky sacks. So I found like reading books and listening to audiobooks of other really famous entrepreneurs that I find they all have uh, stories of when they were kids, like ridiculous things they did, like door to door selling pickles or something or whatever. So for myself, it was, uh, I did magic as a kid and then I also sold hacky sacks and then uh, did plays and stuff and put on plays. Anybody else had any really ridiculous things they did? No, I just, <laughs> these are all Google images, okay. except for a couple of them I took with a sweet iPhone 6 Plus camera, okay. but I didn't take that one. Any of you guys have any, uh, like, cool, weird things to do as kids? I sold fish. Sold fish? When we went out and got Caitlin, I came home and sell them, like, instead of lemonade stand, I had Caitlin. Nice, Caitlin stand, <laughs> awesome. Paper routes or what? No, I, I typed up all my notes in junior high. So to every student in the school. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Did yeah. you make some good bank off that? Right? Yeah, I made a few hundred dollars actually. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> Pretty nice, yeah. Yeah, it's it's something that all all people seem to, you know, have that later on go on to start businesses, they seem to have something in their past that was well, when you look back at it, it was kind of like they started a business, even if it was only they made a couple hundred bucks doing it or or got some free bags of chips out of it or whatever it was. It was like that drive to sort of create something and sell something or whatever. Um, so then usually you do, you, there's, this, is, this one is sort of like uh, something I've learned after trying things I'm not passionate about. Um, because as you achieve some success, you kind of wonder, okay, well, what do I want to, I want to keep doing something I'm not passionate about and you'll sabotage yourself and um, unless you're, you you don't have ADHD or whatever, then you can keep focused on something you're just not into. But I would say for everybody uh, starting a good lesson that I learned was to, to sort of do something I'm really passionate about. Because if you're not passionate about it, <clears throat> you're going to, you're going to probably try something else and then that'll suffer, right? Because you'll get distracted and, um, and then it's also you do save taxes if you do <laughs> if you start making some good money and then you're doing something you really like you're going to be going on trips with you know people that are into it and you're going to be going to conferences and you, you know hobbies so I guess one a good example would be like films I made I made films right so um, I can I can go to uh, I can go to movies and write them off on my taxes and stuff because I'm researching right. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, so how did I start? What did, you know, I wrote this film, The Legend of the Psychotic Forest Ranger. I didn't go to a startup school like you guys. I wish I had something like this, and it's awesome that this is, this is available. Um, I, I wrote a script, and then I needed some money, and I needed a, a, a job that wasn't really a job because I was going to have to take three months off to film a movie, and I was going to be gone all the time. So I thought, okay, I, ne I need to Google how, how to make money online. So this is how I got in, you know, in uh, introduced to the world of startups. 
it was Googling, how do we make money on the internet? <laughs> and I'm sure you guys have seen this ad, you know, when you're on Facebook or whatever, it's local mom makes thousands of dollars a week from her computer. So my startup school courses were things like survey sites, you know, where you'd pay a hundred bucks and they'd send you a, a piece of paper that says, go to these websites and fill out surveys. And it's all like closed websites and crap. Uh, gas saving pills. It was just, here, take these random chemicals and sell them to people and tell them it saves you money on gas. I didn't know how it worked or not. So I didn't, I didn't really like that one too well. Freebie sites, like, you know, refer a hundred friends to fill out offers for affiliate sites and then you get a free iPod. Uh, casino deposit bonuses was a big one. It was like, I don't know if you guys have that course here. Do you have that course here? You don't, you don't cover that one? Casino deposit bonuses? No. Oh, that was one of my courses. It was like, you know, the casinos will want new players, so if you deposit 50 bucks, they'll give you 200 bucks if you're an affiliate. So people would go pay other people to go deposit 50 bucks, and you get 100 bucks out of it, and they get 50 bucks out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be up all night long, like, doing these casino things, and I got ulcers because I you have to play with the 50 bucks, and I'm, like, playing bingo and all this stuff. <laughs> like, go four in the morning, figuring out how to get as many deposits as I can, and then I just decided, okay, i got to go to the next thing. And the next thing, unfortunately, was Ponzi schemes. So it's like, you know, invest a hundred bucks and then you'll get more money and then you'll get more money and all this weird crap. So I got scammed a lot uh, on my Google tuition. And then it, and then my next thing is actually like network marketing and MLM. And I'm sure you've been, you know, probably heard of like Amway and stuff like that. Um, it's got a real bad uh, vibe to it or a bad rep, but I, I, I see some um, people here and some Spanish or something. I, I googled this image because I knew that uh, Warren Buffett bought Pampered Chef and you know one of the most successful investors of all time buying like a network marketing company and this is the only thing I could find. I don't know what any of this says but I, I'm, I know that uh, some of these guys are pretty successful and they all have something to do with network marketing and I actually found that I did learn a lot of things when I was doing that and network marketing is and when it's a good product and something you believe in, um, it's taught me anyway how, how to learn. And, uh, you know, before, instead of just give me money and I'll send you the stupid survey site or these weird gas bills or, or get scammed in some investment scheme or whatever, it was, it was, it was a good learning experience for me. And it taught me that uh, these, mainly these five things, it was setting goals, um, which I've carried on from my... <laughs> attempt at learning how to make money on the internet to then starting a business. These are the main things that actually turned out to uh, work in my favor and it was all things I learned from doing like uh, selling network marketing products online and I would treat it like a real job. I'd like call people all day long. Yep. This is one of those stupid questions you mentioned there. Awesome. Um, I don't, I'm not entirely familiar with network marketing. Um, do people you with the product they want you to sell. So what it is, it's like uh, Amway is a big, huge one. It's like they have products like toilet paper and soap and whatever it is, right, that you just use. And then you sign up as a distributor for them, and then you sell the products to your friends and your family and people who want it from online leads and stuff. It's a form of online marketing if you treat it like that. Um, but a lot, it gets a bad rap because people start just bugging their friends and family about it and be like, hey, join my business. It only costs 500 bucks and you get all the soap and then you end up with a garage full of soap and <laughs> no friends and family that want to talk to you anymore because people don't treat it like, like, a, like a school or whatever, or like a, a course to learn from or, or a real business. So it becomes, gets a bad rap because, yeah, people just verbal diarrhea all over <laughs> Your friends and family. That's kind of a gross uh, analogy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you do it right, you treat it kind of like a tuition, I guess, or a, or or a job, and um, you learn some really good things. So gratitude is something big that you know I talked about that at first. It was I should be grateful for the things that I've accomplished, and if if it wasn't for sort of these uh, programs I went through, like books I read and stuff. I probably wouldn't think that gratitude is important, but yeah, it is important. You sh should be thankful for what you have and be thankful for what you've accomplished and people around you that support you and um, everything that you have that uh, 
helps you out, right? So, and then it also helps you to sell. Like you're gonna have to sell no matter what. I don't know if you guys cover that much, but yeah, you you gotta sell your ideas. You have to sell your products. You have to sell your t your classmates. You know, you have to sell yourself. Like why should I you invest in me or why should you listen to me or uh, you know, if you're making an information or sorry, a, like a consumer product for the web or something, you have to sell investors. You have to sell customers through marketing, and then you can watch this movie as well. <laughs> uh, I don't know why that happened, but let me get it back. I'll put AirPlay back on. That'll do it. Presentation mode. Play button, good call. Thank you, sir. <coughs> and this is me, actually. You know, for w one of the things I did was I set a goal of uh, climbing a giant ice phallic structure, <laughs> and I did it. <laughs> I did it, and I was grateful for it. Where is that? This is in Kelowna, uh, BC. Wait, is it? It's like big, big white mountain. Yeah. Um, it's one of the most like peaceful, soul refreshing things that I've ever done. Is go up to a mountain in BC and ski and climb phallic ice structures. That's me at the bottom. I didn't get me at the top, but trust me, I did it. <laughs> My forearms really hurt afterwards. Is that like a man-made thing? Like yeah, it's the biggest ice climbing structure in North America. It's man-made. So they have, they just dump water over this thing and it continually ices up and they go up and chip off the loose parts because it's well, dangerous if you don't do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was uh, something I had set myself to say if I accomplish this, I'm going to reward myself with this trip. And then I did it and I went and did the trip and my wife was awesome for letting me go. And I'm grateful for her letting me do that. So anyway, after you know my my uh, internet. <laughs> tuition stuff, my startup school sort of thing. I met my partner and my mentor and we sort of had like a 50-50 handshake. It was, he was sort of my angel investor. And uh, it was it was a deal where he said, how much do you need to work on this idea you have? It was, I didn't want to continue working for someone else doing the network marketing stuff. I wanted to make my own business and, and uh, make money for this movie I wanted to make. And he was a higher up sort of like in the company um, rep. He had done like eight figures in sales or something like that. And he was pretty high up in training people and traveling around, opening up different territories in China and stuff. And then uh, he went away for a business trip to in China to open up uh, the product there. And when he came back, I had already left and started this website. And uh, he said, okay, well, let's do something. I'll pay for your rent. You know, you just stay home and work on this idea. And I was like, all right, <laughs> I'll do that. You're going to pay for my rent, and I, all I have to do is stay home and work. Oh, that's what I want to do. So I quit my job as a delivery driver. I was delivering furniture for Easy Home. And, and then I just sort of, like, have been, you know, working with, with him ever since. And it worked out really well for us. Um, so find an angel investor, I guess, is a good uh, a good lesson there. But it's not an easy one. <laughs> um and this is a good quote on taking action. And it's kind of maybe cliche, you may have seen it before, but I bet you've never seen it with a husky and a naked yeah. guy. <laughs> so you miss you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. So I guess I don't know why they took this shot, but oh he's yeah, okay. I don't know what, what his shot was there, but the quote stands still, right? It's if you don't take shots, you're not gonna you're not gonna hit your target or whatever. And then my adding addition to that would be, I guess, if you take the shots, you're going to eventually be in the right place in the right time. And, you know, some people say, oh, well, did you get lucky? And I think, would think for a long time, yeah, I just got lucky. But then, you know, if you just continually take shots and you're not going to give up on it, you just don't give up, then, yeah, you're going to be in the right place in the right time. It'll show up for you eventually if you don't, if you don't, stop hustling and uh, yeah um, so then that was when we launched our Facebook games and the Facebook games was probably like our 20th idea sort of business that we had launched in the first year of my, my partner and I uh, working together 
and it worked out really well for us. Uh, that was one that started generating multiple six figures for us, and then eventually it was the the big one for us. It did seven figures in revenue, and it was just three of us in our basements, and uh, we were static. And you know, I was uh, uh, grateful that I had this success, and I still am. And the lesson, though, I would say is what what I learned after this was I had done it just on a straight up split, so one of the partners in the company had 33% of the equity of the company. And he was very happy with passion checks, five figures a month and didn't want to grow at all. So he was just, we, we wanted to take money, you know, and stop just taking it in, in our bank accounts and put it towards the company and grow the company and cash in on that big wave of like Zynga and Playfish and all those big game companies that grew. Um, Cause we were there at the very beginning when Facebook opened up and let developers make games. So one of our partners was sort of like, yeah, I don't want to do that. I just, I kind of like having this money come in. So my partner, George, and I were thinking, all right, well, how are we going to invest all of our money into this and grow it when one partner is taking up so much of the equity that it's going to be so tough to make decisions and stuff. Um, so yeah, equity is important if you, if you, if that's a chicken and the egg scenario because I didn't have any money to give this guy at the beginning. It was it was like I was broke and I had this wicked idea. I needed a developer, so he was like, "Okay, I'll do it for free." So I'm not complaining <laughs> about it. I don't know if it's a good lesson, but think about that. Think about equity. Uh, how you're going to structure your company? Because yeah, you don't want to have someone who's, if you are successful with it, that takes up a lot of your equity that you can't make decisions and grow the company. So then the next thing was we started. Uh, Slightly social, which was uh, with his blessing, a contact. We, we what we called him, and we said, "Hey, do you mind if we start another company? We'll still do this. These games, we'll still support them, um, but we want to grow. We want to grow big, and you know, we want to invest a lot of the money that we're getting from the games into this new company." And he gave us our blessing to go ahead and do it without him. So we sort of had the Facebook game company still on the side, and then we started slightly social. And that was actually where I met Gavin. So Gavin, I don't know if you guys know this or not, but Gavin was the CTO for Slightly Social at the beginning. And um, so I found him through um, another app that he had made. This was uh, 2010 or nine or something like that. He made an app for uh, sort of like communicating. Oh, that's my mom. Sorry, mom. <laughs> hey, ma. I'm in the middle of a presentation. Oh, okay, love you too. Bye. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, can't hang up on your mother. That's rude. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, he made this app that was like skill swap or share swap, and it was like, you know, I know how to play guitar. I want to learn how to farm, and it was kind of like a little social currency thing where you would connect to people. It was a pretty awesome idea, and I saw he was a great programmer, and so I contacted him. I said, Do you want to? come to this game company with us and um, we eventually we had this idea and it was supposed to be like cost us about twenty thousand dollars to build in three months and then it ended up sort of like feature creeping so then we started thinking oh wouldn't it be cool if the app did this and wouldn't it be cool if the app did this and then you know let's scrap let's uh, rewrite the whole thing again because this this certain technology isn't working properly and it was a lot of lessons to learn there about like building a product and, and building a team and stuff as we, we started scaling up and we hired a few people and um, it was supposed to take like three months I think and it was like 11 months in and we were over $100,000 in cost and and then I went to GDC and saw Eric Ries talk. I don't know if you guys know Eric Ries from Lean Startup. So I saw him talk. This was like when he was first talking about Lean Startup and he told the story about how Dare.com spent millions of dollars to build the perfect product and I'm sure you guys know about that story and then they they ended up completely failing and you know they didn't make any money and then they started the uh, sec what was the other one? IMVU. IMVU yeah they started IMVU and it was just like scrappy and it was just them and a couple guys working on it and it was a huge success so then I came home from GDC I came home early and I was like okay guys we gotta like do this stuff that I learned at GDC 
And it was like, you know, we're, we're already working on this, this game for a year now. And I'm just like trying to like change it instantly to go from what we had been doing for a year with this team to like instantly overnight change it up to be something completely different because I heard this guy talk about it. <laughs> and uh, it was good intentions or whatever, but it was too late. It was We were running out of money. And we had it, we gave it about a two-month go. We, we tried to do this rapid iteration, continuous deployment stuff. Uh, instead of, you know, like every month you push something and you try to build it perfect, um, you, be, you know, use the agile development method and test things out and pivot and everything. Like those are pretty commonplace lessons now that people put into practice, which is the way you should do it. Use it for the startup. But we eventually ran out of money with that, and then I had to lay everybody off, and we kind of learned a big lesson there that um, lean startup is the way to go. You know, don't just spend like a year and all your money on one product. Um, test things out, rapid iteration, all that stuff. So then the other thing that I would like to talk about here is the emotional roller coaster. And not sure if you guys have covered that much. Emotional roller coaster. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you say you have? I do like every presentation. Every presentation. <laughs> well, the emotional roller coaster is a pretty. This is really bad quality. It looks way better on my phone. <laughs> Maybe I'll just bring my phone around and show you guys. You know, this is a, a funny little drawing. I think went around social media before. This is what people think success is, right? And this is what it really looks like. And the emotional roller coaster is a similar thing. It's just like, you know, up there's high points and then really low points. And then, you know, you kind of get back up and down as different things happen. And I, I've never talked about this before. And I don't even think I've told Gavin this, but after, after the success that they had with Go Instant, this is what my life was for about three months. <laughs> Ice cream. Oh my God. You know, like how could I have, uh, been working with somebody so talented and everything and just let that go and then look what they did look what they did and I'm I'm sitting here out of money like completely depressed over the success that they had I yeah, I hope you're watching this <laughs> I think ice cream sales sort of took a, a boost for a little while but you know this is the real stuff that you guys will go through and so maybe someone in the class is going to make millions of dollars and you kind of be sitting there thinking, why couldn't it be me? <laughs> you know, so, but eventually, I get, this slide is in the wrong place, but it's kind of appropriate, so I'll just play it anyway. Um, yeah, people do not wander, this is a quote by Zig Ziglar, people do not wander around and then find themselves at the top of Mount Everest. You hit what you aim at, and if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. So it's not like, you know, you can just sit there and be depressed and then things are going to work out for you and it's not like they got lucky with their success. I mean, they worked hard at it, right? So I kind of use that as that story of, of uh, Gavin and the guys making, uh, raising the first round to uh, learn from it and be motivated by it. And eventually that's what sort of like made me passionate about trying again with Slightly Social. And I would say that's... Uh, a good lesson as well. Uh, learn, try to always be coachable. Again, that's something from before, but be coachable, be willing to learn. Um, constantly be just trying to, um, I guess, be humble is, is maybe, maybe what it is. And then again, don't give up and keep taking shots with your naked guy and your husky. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of like, I think it was maybe a six months later or so, I. I ended up using Gavin's uh, success with Go Instant and sort of had a couple phone calls with him and asked him for some tips and how did they raise the money and um, you know what's what tech stack did they use how are they organizing their projects because it was something that we sort of tried to do with slightly social version one but it was too far gone with it at the point and uh, I realized that I wanted to emulate what they had ended up succeeding with and they were really heavy into the the uh, lean startup stuff and they're making it work so I sort of modeled my next shot <laughs> at, at uh, success with with what they're doing and started using Trello and hip chat and um, doing daily scrums with everybody and it worked out pretty well we ended up raising a seven-figure round for the company and um, when I was talking to the investor I called Gavin up and asked him for some tips on like what what do I what, should, what do I say to this guy? <laughs> I've never asked for this kind of money before. 
And one of the things was, you know, ask for what you want. So if you ever get into a situation where someone's w willing to give you money and you've got past that point of the pitch and they're, now it's sort of that ice is broken and um, they like you and they maybe want to invest in you, don't feel like you should ask for less because if you need a million dollars, ask for a million dollars, right? My first ask was $10,000 a month for this. Uh, for this exact round from the same investor. And then the next day I, I was like, why did I do that? I, I could probably ask him for more money and we're going to need more money to grow the staff and, and to acquire other products yeah. and stuff. So I went back and luckily he, he was understanding to it and um, with, with a better pitch and a bit more confidence and just going for it and <coughs> asking for what I really wanted, um, we worked out a deal. So it could have been like a six figure, low six figure round, but it ended up being more because that was one, one big thing I learned to, to really ask what you're going to need because you're, you're always going to want money in your war chest. Um, so ask for, ask for uh, more and then usually you'll chicken out and ask for less, but it'll still be enough because <laughs> you don't want to, you don't want to start low. So with, with this company, we ended up building out hundreds of MVP apps. So minimum viable product apps, uh, in 2013 and part of yeah 2013 is when we raised the money um two of the games went top 10 top 15 sorry uh, usa free so they're getting like hundreds of thousands of downloads a day for a couple days um that was so i went sort of the opposite i went from with version one of slightly social we learned all the lessons uh of building out one product and trying to make it perfect and never you know, never really like testing it out with customers and then iterating on it. So this time we did it the other way. We launched games when they were, you know, basically we found a marketing strategy that worked with App Store optimization and we could launch these games, minimum viable products and, uh, and see if they're going to work with what demographic. And then if they did work, we'd invest some more into them and then we'd put marketing dollars into them. So it worked, uh, but the problem, the lesson I suppose that I can give you guys from that is I scaled up too fast with this company. So I ended up with a staff of like 14 people or 16, something like that people in the first six, seven months of, of raising the money. And it was, it was something I was trying to model after, uh, have you guys ever talked about Dan Pink before? So I would say if you guys want some homework, uh, go watch Dan Pink's Ted talk. It's only like 15 minutes long and it's it's uh, about the new culture sorry uh, sort of of um, work and life balance and everything but also how to use autonomy mastery and purpose um, to realize how uh, people that are working creatively are motivated and what will make them stick with you versus uh, people who are just you know working in a factory is sort of like point a point b just you know, it's, there's no creativity involved. What you guys are doing is all creativity, right? You're creating things, you're writing code, you're coming up with ideas. So it's very important to learn the psychology of how to talk to other people that you're going to end up wanting recruiting and how to motivate them. Um, so one of the things that I screwed up big time on was not motivating Gavin and Dave and Kirk to stick with me for <laughs> the next product, right? So. That's a big lesson to learn is, you know, you got superstars. You want to like, you want to stick with the superstars, right? You don't want to be working with people who are A and B or C and B players. You only want to work with A players. So um, A players will sort of cultivate other A players. And if you're working with people who are C players and B players, the, a, the stars will just sort of like not want to be part of that. So they'll pretend like they're not stars around you. So they'll dumb themselves down because they don't want to be recruited to a company or a team or whatever that's full of like C and B players. So it's very important to uh, find A players, work with A players. And there's a whole, if you Google Dan Pink and watch his TED talk, there's a, there's a lot of resources about working with A players and how to attract stars and how to motivate people and sort of find that work-life balance for, for the creative um, tech type companies that I'm sure everybody's trying to build here. Um, so then that's the last four or five years of my life, I guess, and my entrepreneurship journey. 
then it goes back to the beginning for me and I think okay what makes do do what makes you happy um, so you guys may not be at this point yet you may some of you may be it may be something where you're thinking in my what, what do I want to do in my life what's gonna make me happy or maybe you're just hungry for that first success uh, but for me an MVP app factory was not fulfilling for me like making a hundred low quality apps just to test market out it wasn't really something that after a year of doing it it was like oh, I can't wait to continue doing this for the rest of my life <laughs> this is awesome <laughs> so we scaled down a little bit well we scaled down a lot uh, now we're, we're still profitable it still makes money for us we're still making games but it's more high, higher quality games it's, it's uh, I'm still on that journey with that company and uh, a little side lesson I suppose is Bitcoin I got into Bitcoin as well. Um, I don't know if you guys heard about Bitcoin too much, but it's oh, yeah. it's like the internet money. And I got into Bitcoin in 2010 when it was like before this, like down here when it was like just sort of starting out. And then I that was after uh, after slightly social one version one. I got into Bitcoin a bit and then started mining it and and like building some businesses, just testing out some some ideas for it, and then eventually. It crashed, and then I was like, "Okay, uh, this is too volatile for me. I, I, I gotta, I gotta do something else." And then I just sort of sat on it for a while, and then it hit eleven hundred dollars just recently. And now there's all this innovation going on. Mark Andreessen's investing in it. PayPal just said that they were going to take some steps towards integrating Bitcoin. And, uh, Google is talking about maybe integrating Bitcoin. So there's a lot of infrastructure being built around this, around Bitcoin. So it is something that's sort of always I'm always watching it. I, I still I started mining again when I, I got in back in here. When it was 1100, I was like, okay, all right. I can, I, I don't want to get distracted from this company, but I got to do something in Bitcoin now. Look at this. So anyway, I got back into it and mining and and started uh, investing in some companies and stuff. And um, yeah. So so Bitcoin. A little a little side lesson here was. I, like I said, I met my partner on the internet doing this uh, sales job, and I, it was like a 50-50 handshake deal with him. And he's been like through thick and thin, like through good times and bad times, through like running seven figures through a basement on a 50-50 handshake. He's not even – he's in states, and I'm in Canada. We've never met before, <laughs> you know. It, it says a lot about his character, and um, he ended up coming to my wedding and stuff, and uh, – He's just more like a big brother to me than than a uh, than a partner, but that worked out so well that I'm so I I got so trusting of everybody else that I met doing business with online that it sort of I sort of forgot to vet people out. So one lesson I'd say is just vet everybody out. Make sure you do your research on who you're going to work with, even if it's someone who's going to invest in you. So you you know it's investing, getting investor and getting partners is like a marriage you don't want to be stuck with someone who's totally not your in your same frequency right um, so my lesson there is I started a mining company with a guy who I had known for five years who would actually worked for me for a contract job a little bit and uh, we were sending him money to pay for the rent for the facility that we had hosted all of our mining gear in and uh, he said he was paying off the bills and he was paying the power company and he was paying the rent and then two or three months later and we had gone down to this place a couple times and it totally looked legit but I just you know he had told me through the years that he was he made up a million dollars off of sorting Facebook stock and here's all the guys that make money with them and he had an angelist profile with his, his venture fund and all this stuff so I'm like all right this guy's doing well I'll partner with him turns out that wasn't really as accurate as he wanted us to believe and he wasn't paying the bills and he was in trouble with money and he stopped paying all the bills so much that everything got seized and we lost all the equipment all the bitcoin mining equipment and the fbi got like a cyber terrorist operation <laughs> <laughs> so it was like so all because i just didn't bet this guy out to see if he really was this multi-millionaire you know dc that he was making us believe he was um, and it, we sort of saw the signs and started, we got one bit of the equipment out, but then by the time it, we lost uh, a, a pretty penny 
<laughs> off of that one mistake of not vetting out this guy. So that was a big hit as well. I went back. I should have another ice cream slide in here because that was another ice cream moment on the emotional roller coaster. So happy, all this money. Look, I got into Bitcoin when it was ten bucks, and now it's up to eleven hundred bucks. And I just all buy all this mining equipment and gone. So, so vet out there. Vet people out. That's uh, really important. And you think it would be pretty obvious, but oops. Um, so Cameron Harold, if you're into googling, and he's got a TED talk as well, and he's the guy I met at this same conference uh, where I asked the stupid question to Guy Kawasaki. I met him, he's the CTO of 1-800-GOT-JUNK, you know, like nine-figure company, the COO, sorry, and he's, he's not anymore, I think he left them a year ago or something, but now he's doing like writing and speaking and stuff. He, uh, the strategy he uses is whether it's your partners, whether it's your investors even, if you got, you know, guts to ask an investor for, for references, but uh, partners, employees, whatever. He will, so what he'll do is in a conversation, um, he'll, when you're interviewing somebody or talking about an idea or whatever, you just kind of casually ask, you know, so what happened with uh, your last your last startup? And then they may say, like, ah, oh, I didn't get along with the co-founder or whatever. It was, it was a piece of crap or whatever it was. And then you sort of, like, take <laughs> mental notes or if you're doing it through email, just take notes and, and sort of ask. Um, questions about negative experiences, like three or four or five negative experiences you've had with people in the past, jobs, partners, whatever. And then after, if they make it through that, the interview process, say, okay, now, now I want to see the names and numbers of those five people that you told me you had bad experiences with, and I need to buy tomorrow. And then they might say, well, what do you mean, <laughs> like that you trapped me or whatever? But you want to save yourself the hassle of doing what I did. You know, you got to kind of like be confident and ask for those negative experiences because sure everybody's gonna have negative things about them that and they're not gonna always say it like like so willy-nilly like I do but you want to know that and you'll save yourself a lot of headache by finding out the bad things and and you know the down the downfalls and the shortcomings because sure people are gonna say what are my you know what people aren't gonna write on the resume all the bad things they've done <laughs> or their but their negative things like oh tell me some negative things about yourself I'm too motivated, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> uh, so, so that is important. And then you follow up with those people and they give you, they give you the, uh, references or the contacts or whatever. If you follow up with them, you just say, listen, I'm going to get into a relationship with this person, whether it's employee, employer or partner. I want to, uh, I want to avoid like a dramatic blow up in the future or us losing a lot of money. So you're going to do so-and-so a favor by telling me now what happened between you guys. What was the problem? Like, why did you guys, you know, <laughs> why did you guys stop your company or why did you get fired or whatever? And, I mean, it's not like to say that if someone has something bad that happened, you're going to not work with them. It's just you want to be aware and know if it's something you can get past or not. Um, because I would have found out that this guy didn't have a venture fund that he said he had and that, you know, he, he wasn't a multimillionaire investor like he was trying to say he was. Um, so, anyway, and then just if there's drama surrounding people, just try to avoid that because it, you want to focus all your time on building your product and building a team and um, coding and, and marketing and stuff. And when it starts getting into people like having all these personal issues and stuff, it just becomes time consuming, right? So try to stay away from drama if you can. That's a, that's a big one. So back to like what's what's the why why are you doing this and this may not be so pertinent for you guys right now but I mean it's something you're gonna run into eventually like what motivates you you, you, you should always be uh, all I find anyway that when I go to conferences where it's talking about not so much technical stuff it always comes back about like what what motivates you to continue on doing what you're doing why do you want to achieve success why do you want to build this company like what are your motivating factors and for me it's uh, in Cape Breton, I want to be able to afford to come and travel home once or twice a year and, and see my grandparents and my dad and everybody and um, visit the Big Fiddle and all that awesome stuff. Um, being there for my daughter and my wife went to Disney World the first after the after the Bitcoin thing happened. I was like, I just connected from a, for a little bit. After, I was having my ice cream session and I was like, okay, I gotta go do something fun. I got to disconnect from the stress for a bit. So we went to Disney World and that was awesome. It was I've never been there before and it was it was really cool. My partner went with his family too. 
first time we, the families met after working together like six years. Um, creative fulfillment, so making movies is really what motivates me, so uh, it's uh, find out what motivates you and um, do that. And then striving to be 100% honest. I mean, you may look like an idiot sometimes, but honesty is always better than hiding things and trying to embellish yourself and try to like um, oversell yourself. It's just best with your partners, with your your uh, wife or your husband or girlfriend or whatever, um, with your kids even. Just honesty. <laughs> I can't say enough about being honest, and it's tough to be 100% honest. Like sharing what hurts and sharing what makes you vulnerable. That is super important, especially in business. Um, fitness was important to me and then learning. So like listening to podcasts and like you guys are doing right now, obviously I don't need to talk about that one. So fitness, uh, here's my before and after pictures from P90X. I, when I was sort of like work, I wasn't working out. And I was, I was always like overweight as a kid and stuff. And then I got, I got interested in fitness. It was one of my personal goals. And there I am with Tony Horton. I don't know if you guys know who that is, but he's the guy from P90X. He's punching me in the face. <laughs> I love that picture. I cherish it always. And it was, uh, you know, I would say, what do you guys want to accomplish this year? You should always be aware of your goals, and you should have something to strive for. That was this year? Uh, no, this was a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. Um, but I started again. I started working out again. I'm back to the gym, back to like half an hour a day. Um, so I don't know if you guys know who Noah Kagan is. He's from AppSumo.com. Uh, he's a blog, OK Dork. He was like one of the f first employees at Facebook. He was uh, one of the first employees at Mint.com, and then he started AppSumo. He's got an awesome bl uh, po blog post. It's very short. I would I would Google that Noah Kagan 2014 processes. You've yeah. seen that before. Cool. So. Uh, the Cole's notes of it is like he he says it he talks about a little bit about the importance of like setting your goals and and then he boils it down to in health wealth and love write three things that you want to accomplish this year um, you know be more honest you know be and then you know come up with a goal like uh, I want to make a hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is that you want to do with wealth or be more responsible with money whatever it is. Just focus on those three things, health, wealth, and love, and then come up with three things that you'd be happy with achieving. And then three words to describe yourself, and these are words that you want yourself to be. So if you're fearless or if you're not fearless, maybe say you're fearless and then strive to be that. Um, and then what am I afraid of doing? And then think of something you're afraid of doing, and then throughout the year work up to doing that, like talking to people. <laughs> about your ice cream binges um, and then I guess I was trying to think of like I was at the perk like a half hour ago trying to think how do I finish a talk I don't know I've never finished a talk so I guess I'll just finish with the meaning of life I guess that's an easy one <laughs> so at this conference I met this monk Dan Dapani you can google him too he's awesome uh, he so this is an easy one I take this home do this one uh, you know, he had a talk, it was like five minutes on the meaning of life. And he gave he gave us a couple of exercises and a couple of things to do to try to obtain happiness and all that stuff. And this is an easy one that you can do. And it's got to do with making your bed. So who makes your bed in the morning? I just started making my bed a couple months ago. It's it's I know, I, I should be should have been doing that. Most people don't right now, but it's okay. I was in your shoes. A couple months ago. So the importance of making your bed every day is to finish what you start, um, to do it better than you think you can, right? So the first thing you're going to do in the morning is get out of bed. You started sleeping, finish sleeping. Finishing sleeping is making your bed. Uh, and do it better than you think you can. So, you know, take, don't just throw the pillow back on or whatever. Just take, take two minutes out of your day and straighten the sheet. You know, and put the pillow so it's however you prefer it. And getting into a ritual like this will transition from just making your bed to everything else you do eventually. So if you build these habits of of being starting your day off with you know the sandwich, I added that one in there. I don't know if that makes sense, but you you sandwich your day with successful tasks. So you start off 
in the morning, make your bed, do it better than you think you can. Um, and then at the end of the day, you're going to have a made bed. <laughs> What's better than a made bed? Right? It's nice to climb into a made bed. And then that will eventually go into the other areas of your life and that habit of, of doing things better will, uh, will hopefully go into your business life as well. So that's the end of my, my, uh, my talk on entrepreneurship and the meaning of life. I don't, know, I don't know how long that went. It was supposed to be 15 minutes, I guess. <laughs> Brad, I apologize. I have to go. No problem. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, make your bed. <laughs> My wife is always up now for you. Well, our rule, our rule is uh, whoever gets out of bed last makes the bed. Yeah. So yeah. it's usually me. <laughs> yeah. All right.